everybody, good morning and welcome to the next installment in my little mini-series on mid-engine V8 Ferraris. Not including the specials, no F40 this week, sorry. Today we're looking at a car that I have driven a very long time ago and I've been looking forward to a reunion ever since. We are in a Ferrari 360 Modena. Now the modern bit here just really means that it's the coupe and this car is remarkable for a few different reasons. First off, the 360 Modena in manual is the car to buy according to Aldous at AV Engineering and he knows a thing or two about Ferraris. So if you're thinking about buying a car and you want his approval, this is probably a very good place to start. Secondly, this car now has 161,436 miles on the clock. As long-term viewers of the channel will know, I am a fan of high-mileage Ferraris, and this car is proof, like my own 550, that you can both enjoy and look after them. So I'm very grateful to its owner Giles for bringing it out to me. This, believe it or not, is pretty much his daily. It's a car he bought because he wanted something that was somewhat more usable. He has another, much newer Ferrari in his stable. But this is the one that gets driven and enjoyed. The other unusual thing about this car is the fact that it is pretty much completely standard. I haven't really spotted anything amiss with it. Even the exhaust is as original. And when's the last time you saw a Ferrari 360 with the original exhaust and the original rear grille? Most of them have the challenge item, which is sort of black perforated piece, which does look very nice, but isn't how many of these cars came from the factory. Now this one's been specified in a sort of very gentle shade of Grigio alloy with of course that beautiful six-speed gated shifter proudly wearing the patina of over 160,000 miles and you've got quite a bit of leather in here too including the headlining and the rear bench both of which I think were optional. The last time I drove a 360 it was also a manual but a spider and it was about 10 years ago so really any memory I have of that car isn't particularly valid in the context of what I do now. Although it's coming out in the middle of my series on V8s, this is actually the second to last video that I'm going to film. With any luck, the last to do is the 458. The 360 was a big step change for Ferrari in both the way they wanted people to use the cars and their construction methodologies. This is really the first all-aluminium Ferrari, or certainly the first all-aluminium road-going car. The chassis was constructed by a firm called Alcoa, and it's pretty much the same as the one you'd find in a 430 as well. You've got double wishbone suspension front and rear and the bodywork too is a combination of aluminium and composite. The engine is an evolution of the unit you found in the 355. With a standard exhaust it doesn't sound anywhere near as musical as that car can but it produces 400 horsepower, not a lot of torque and revs happily to just over eight and a half thousand. Serious consideration was also given to trying to make this car a more usable and dailyable prospect. To that end, you can actually do cam belt changes on this car somewhat cheaper than in the 355 because the official procedure does not involve the engine coming out. In fact, the official way to do a cam belt on a 360 is from inside the car. There's a big removable panel back here and basically you'll see a tech inside your car doing the belt from within. Quite amazing to see. You've got plenty of storage space up front and the car is exceptionally well damped. Even on rough British B roads for a supercar, this thing rides really nicely. It's sitting on original specification, although mercifully not original, Pirelli P0 Asymmetricos 2 to complete the period look. One of the reasons that I really love high mileage cars is because if done properly, things get changed on them. They are looked after, so you're less likely to find a car like this with 15 year old tires on it, as has happened to me a few times in the past. The last two weeks in real time, I've actually spent with oldest Voices' very own F430. That's a somewhat modified example, and it's a, a very different car to the 360. I know in many ways they should be basically the same, but truthfully, they aren't. 
Now that's an F1 box car and this is manual, which does make a big difference. This gearbox is pretty nice. Second is a little bit reluctant, even when warm, but the rest of the gears come willingly enough. It's a fairly short throw. It doesn't click and clack as much as some other Ferrari boxes do, but it's still a very nice thing to use and the gear lever is in exactly the right place. You just put your hand down there and it's where you hope it would be. Of course, this doesn't have the ridiculous firepower of the 430. In reality, it's not actually that much faster than a 355. Although many claims of weight saving may have been made at the time, the reality is this car weighs perhaps 20 kilos less than the old Berlinetta. Now, one option that disappeared with the introduction of the 360 was the GTS variant of the car, the, the Targa Top. There was actually a sort of equivalent that most people have never heard of, because you could order a Ferrari 360 with a sunroof. And it worked pretty much like the old 355's Targa Top. It was a big trapezoidal shaped panel up here that you could stow behind the rear seats. Very, very few of those cars were ever sold. Something like about 12 of them or so, and I think that could be worldwide production. The model was officially introduced in 1999, with the Spider coming a little bit later on. F1 gearbox was available from the get-go, and as a result, you do see a lot of these with that as an option. You are, of course, gonna be paying more for a manual these days, but I would say that it probably is worth doing it. It's both a bit easier on maintenance and just far nicer to use. As a daily drivable car, really, this is quite remarkable. It's comfortable, it's quiet with the standard exhaust on, visibility is excellent, not quite as good as 355, but it's there. Steering feel is actually quite nice too. Brake, accelerator, clutch, all very easy to use. This is not a difficult car to drive at all. But it is a Ferrari though. You'll want to know what it's like when you can have some fun. So let's try and do that, shall we? Once you get that exhaust valve to open at about 4,000 RPM, the car does sound a bit more like the screaming V8 that you would hope that it would. The car does talk to you reasonably well, and actually the steering, I think, is some of my favourite of all the cars featured this week. It's not quite as brilliant as the 348s, but actually I think it is better than in the 430. It does talk to you that much more. As you can probably tell, we're out early in the morning, it's rained, some tractors have come along this road, so conditions are not ideal. It's a bit wet, a bit greasy and a bit damp out there with the odd dry patch, so I'm having to exercise some caution. But the car's communicating its abilities to me fairly well. It will shuffle and move under you somewhat, it's not too daunting. It does have basic traction control, but the way to drive these old cars is to pretend that it doesn't, because it's not very good traction control. This flows down the road so well. And it's amazing too when you drive two Ferraris back to back, which are only a generation apart. They're next door neighbors. And you realize just how many things change. The pace of development at Ferrari is absolutely incredible. So for example, this car has no Manitino switch. There is a sport button for the suspension, but you know what? Leave it off because the car's just better that way. It flows so nicely down here. It does feel a little bit like an oversized Elise. It's not got the incredible communication of that car, but you really can have a lot of fun with it. View out the front, magnificent too. You've got those little arches there that sort of point down onto the road. And this is a car that you really do work with. No, it's not ultimately that fast point to point. It doesn't feel any quicker than a 355, honestly. Maybe it is, maybe, but it certainly wouldn't be reason enough to get a 360. Oh, it's a lovely thing, this, it really is. 
still feels very old school Ferrari and indeed old school supercar. You've got to have the biggest respect for this thing, you really do. The 430 has an awful lot more electronics and they're actually smart. You can do stupid things with it and it will somewhat cover up your untidiness. Uh, this one, no, it, it, it really won't. The F430 is more of a sort of loving mother, you know, you could make some sort of horrible, terrible mistake and it'll just go, there, 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 it's, it's fine. This one's like that auntie that you're sort of scared of when you get left with her, because if you make a mistake, it will beat you with a slipper before it then decides whether it does actually want to help you or not. When I was younger, really, I didn't like the 360. I think purely on the way that it looked, because it didn't look like a 355. And the 355 was the greatest car in the world ever. And as you may have seen from my last video, that's something I still somewhat believe. However, I don't think that the 360 deserved at all the sort of hatred that I and many others lumped upon it. I get where Ferrari were trying to go with the styling. It's a, a throwback to some of their old Formula One races on Formula Two as well, I think. The engine still is that glorious Dino unit, even if it doesn't sound quite as brilliant as the old cars here in stock form. But you can get one with a manual gearbox and it's a great daily driver. So with 160 odd thousand miles on the clock, has anything gone terribly, awfully wrong with this car? Not really. Apparently at some point in its history, it did have new heads put on it, but that was very early in the history. So that may have been a warranty item so long ago, was it? The first owner, in fact, only did a few thousand miles in this car. It hasn't had all that many owners all told. Giles himself has put about 17,000 on in less than two years, and he's enjoyed, I would suspect, quite a few of them. I'm enjoying the 360. steering definitely somewhat better than the 430. Just that bit more communicative. It's still a little light, but there seems to be a lot more texture coming through. It works with the road a lot more. Our 360s, of course, do have their faults. I believe they share some with the 430, including ball joints that like to go, but if you put hill engineering ones in, they'll be a lot better. According to the man himself at AV, most 360s out there for sale will probably want something between five to 10,000 pounds worth of work to get them to a really high standard. However, once they're at that standard, they're very good cars to live with. Budget a couple of thousand pounds a year to look after it, and hopefully most years you get some change out of it. They're a popular enough car, being somewhat more common than the 355, that if you want to do fancy things with them, put a bit of carbon in them, that sort of stuff, you can do that. I mean, this interior I never really loved, because there's some really odd choices for our made in here, like the 20 pence digital clock up here, and this aluminium looking stuff they put in. I know what they were trying to do with it, but it, it, it just came across as looking somewhat cheap. You've still got the same sort of toggle switches that you'll find in a 355 or a 550 or anything like that. And the dash again has this sort of aluminium look, which I think is supposed to be maybe even a throwback to the older cars, the Dino and so on and so forth. But to me, it just came across looking a bit naff. You've also got some sort of odd looking digital display, some of which are very similar to you find in the 550 that I just never quite gelled with. I like proper analog dials in my Ferraris, but that's my personal preference. It's perhaps nowhere near as bad as I, I make it out to be. It's, it's a very, very good dash, very clear, very easy to use, and gives you some proper information so you can know what's going on with your lovely car. Apparently, most of the interior trim pieces in here are actually real aluminium. It's just a shame it doesn't look so good. <laughs> I know a lot of people tend to replace them with carbon items, probably because they like carbon, and also the Chanish Dorali had a lot of carbon on the interior as well. If you want to buy one of these now, if you're looking for a car with less galactic mileage, 60 to 70,000 pounds seems to get you into a 360 with a manual box. Of course, you can pick up one with the F1 system for quite a bit less. But really, for me, it would have to be a manual. Given the choice between a manual 360 or an F1 430, which are roughly equivalent in price, actually, I don't know. <laughs> 
I don't know. There's a lot to love about either of them. I think if you want your first supercar to really impress you in terms of pace, 430 is going to be of greater interest to you. But if this is the kind of car you've always idolised, you've always wanted, if you're of a particular generation, then I don't think it's going to disappoint all that much. It's actually impressed me. So there we have it, the Ferrari 360 Modena. Another fine car from our friends at Modena. Please like, comment below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you all for the next one. Bye-bye.